welcome. We're super excited for you to be joining this webinar focused on smart early childhood technology and with a focus on how to leverage our public investments to create more and greater impacts in early childhood. I'm really excited to have this uh, wonderful group of kick-ass women from early childhood to talk about this. They're very passionate and interesting, so I'm hoping that I can get through my stuff and open up the conversation. But first, let me just tell you that Early Learning Lab, uh, what we're really about is supporting new approaches in early childhood to ensure that adults and children's lives have the kind of supports they need to work effectively with children. So that includes innovations in process, but also technology. So not a big surprise that we did this report. We've been talking about this for a while, but it was really a chance for us to say, okay, where are we in this space? And can we begin to uh, tell a larger story of what's happening? And that's why we brought these three states together and also to engender a broader conversation. I wanna thank Imaginable Futures, formerly the Omidyar Network Education Initiative for funding this project. And, and they were particularly interested in our supporting early childhood tech entrepreneurs. So this report and this work was also done with a, an eye towards how do we help them understand this space? How do we help them uh, create a uh, high impact solution. So uh, while we, uh, the report itself has a, a, a sort of a, a bent towards helping them understand what's happening, we also, of course, and our funders wanted to serve as a catalyst for conversation with the early childhood field and stakeholders, many of which are on this phone uh, today with us. So we're looking forward to the conversation with you. Um, so when we talk about smart early childhood technology, want to kind of make the distinction that we are not looking at technology that is child facing. Uh, we really, that's, a, that's another conversation, an important one, but we really feel that in, in the early childhood space, there's just so many ways and so many challenges that we all face that we think that technology can support more and better time between adults and children. So at the end of the day, that's what technology is about. Does it free up time? Does is it create more efficiencies in our programs? Does it streamline operations, support uh, the competency and the skills of early childhood caregivers and educators? So that's what we mean by smart early childhood technology. So this report uh, was an attempt to take a look at where we are and where we need to go. Uh, we also, in terms of kind of what was done to support that effort, what un, sort of underlay the insights that we're gonna be sharing with you today, the conversation we'll be having was getting these three states together and their teams, these leaders and their teams to really take a deep look in their state, to interview um, you know, scores of decision makers and on the ground implementers. And we really wanted to expand the conversation beyond early childhood as we may often think about it, whether that's center-based childcare or family child care, but to also include the health system and um, home visitation, the kind of more of a whole child approach. And so those um, insight interviews are, are the foundation for the work that, that we did in creating the report. We also want to look at funding and financing of early childhood. And as part of that, and especially to help the entrepreneurs, because a lot of you already know this, uh, we wanted to take a look at like, what are the funding streams, being a little bit broader about what's in there, and it was a lot of work, but I'm really excited about the funding analysis that is also part of the report. So that's the basic uh, methodology. Um, with that, and before I get into some of the insights, I want to invite um, Rebecca, uh, yeah, Rebecca and uh, Patricia, as well as Stephanie, to introduce themselves. I'm on mute. Go. Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Berlin, and I'm the Senior Vice President um, of Quality Solutions and Impact at the Ounce of Prevention in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Stephanie Rubin. I'm the CEO of Texans Care for Children. We're a multi-issue children's policy organization based in Austin, Texas. Hi, uh, my name is Patricia Lozano, and I am the Executive Director of Early Edge California. Thanks, thanks to all of you. And like I said, really looking forward to a robust conversation and thanks to your teams for all this work. So um, in terms of the agenda, I'm gonna do a little bit of like what we learned and then we're gonna go into two rounds of discussion. So the first one's gonna be 
some conversation with um, these women about the insights and what was happening in their state and a little bit more texture and color commentary. Uh, and then a second conversation about recommendations. Okay, so what, so yeah, we know all this. What are we gonna do about it? And what are the roles of the different elements of this ecosystem between program implementers, the technologists, government systems, policymakers, and the funders? So um, we're then gonna have a Q&A. You'll then have a chance to tell us what you think about what happened during this webinar, and then um, we'll close. So before we get started, I just wanna go through some housekeeping rules or inside, you know, just some directions. We do encourage you to, to weigh in on this webinar and I wanna thank all of you or many of you. We got a ton of great kind of set, set up questions already. So feel free to weigh in during the webinar. You can participate by using the chat feature in your Zoom toolbar. And um, you have the option of sending your messages either just to the panelists or out to everyone in the group. And you'll do this by toggling the blue send bar in the chat box. So right now, I think you're gonna get a prompt and probably um, a slide on the screen for an opportunity to just spend 60 seconds uh, right now by starting off telling us how you're seeing technology used effectively, are there, way, are there ways that you think it could be leveraged, and then what are the biggest challenges that you're facing when it comes to tech adoption? So you have 60 seconds. So um, I already see we've got uh, 27 people who have something to say here, great. Um, keep them coming. Okay, great, lots, lots of feedback. Uh, thank you so much. All right, so in terms of the learnings, kind of top line insights, we're gonna uh, go through the, these slides quickly, but first kind of what, what did we learn when it came to the landscape? Uh, and, and for many of you, like I said, like you live this, but um, I think the, the work in the three states really confirmed kind of what we're seeing um, in so, sort of big trends in this space. And um, Diane, if you can flip to the next slide, perfect. Um, first, uh, good news uh, is that the field view of technology is shifting. And I, I've seen that myself in even the last few years. I think as we all use technology in so many parts of our life, we realize like, why would there be this big gap where like nothing good could happen? Uh, in, our, uh, in our work in early childhood. So the field's view of technology is definitely shifting. Um, and with that, I think that openness, there's also a lot of challenges in this space and a lot of solutions that have yet to be developed. And a sense that some of the solutions that have been developed so far really could be of higher impact. And we're gonna be talking about like, how do we co-create some of these solutions so we really answer the most uh, pressing issues that we have. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about where technology is most needed in one of the slides that's just about to come up. And, and then lastly, kind of, so, you know, you've got some, some solutions, you're trying them, and what's the experience? And the reality is that people are, there's a lot of breaks in the technology adoption and implementation uh, right now. There's lots of false starts, there's lots of people trying things, and then, you know, maybe getting frustrated that it, they're not able to really use the technology. And, and I think that we're really seeing that that the uh, a kind of holistic tech cycle uh, is not really in place, which means it's not just planning for technology and making good decisions about technology solutions, but it's also about funds for implementation and, and support for implementation, and then the kind of ongoing maintenance. So we've got um, those as sort of big picture um, trends in early childhood. So that seems pretty promising, but lots of challenges, and that's what we're gonna be uncovering and talking about today. So um, then we, you know, through these interviews, like what is most needed in this space? And we heard, uh, you know, again and again, certainly a foundation for this work is data systems, ways for people effectively to um, take data and understand it at all levels. So we've got big system, government system, challenges, we need data integration amongst programs, uh, we need uh, seamless benefits, we need a lot of big, uh, kind of big S system solutions, but we also need that up and down the food chain, right? That people need to have tech solutions that can serve their needs. And that same kind of bucket of, of challenge is program operations, uh, how can we use technology to make those dollars stretch and free up people's time? 
Uh, the second area where we saw kind of a lot of emphasis around what's needed and what kind of solutions do we, do we want to get focused on is how do we actually support quality adult child interactions? How do we take best practice and create solutions in programs, in classrooms that support the educators, the caregivers, and parents to develop the skills that they need to work effectively with children. And we think that um, you know, things like parent engagement, lots of talk about how to leverage technology to also be, um, you know, to address geography and cultural and language difference. So that's another part. And then lastly, recognizing um, that there's also basic tech infrastructure needs. And I think it's, it's improved from where it was in the recent past, but there's still Wi-Fi issues, there's still hardware issues. So obviously, you can't do all this stuff unless you get that taken care of. So that's kind of where do we need solutions created and where do we make, need to take what we have and make it better. So um, key, then I want to talk about a couple key buckets of insight around, and we learned these from the insight interviews and from the look at the funding streams, around decision making and financing for technology. So um, first, you know, and these are, we're kind of looked at, I mean, from the perspective of what do tech entrepreneurs need to, to know, but behind that is, we have a very fractured decision-making process and, and really frankly, I'll let these folks talk about it, most of the time, not really a process at all. Like there's, there's not really a sense, people don't know how to make decisions about technology. Um, and so, you know, you're gonna see some of these other insights flow from that reality, um, but certainly some of the bigger enterprises and not surprisingly have maybe information technology groups, they have more, uh, more likely to have policies about how to think about technology. So that, that's one of the insights. Uh, within this context, this ecosystem and reality then, those early childhood practitioners play a really important role in decision making. Like the folks on the ground are oftentimes the one trying to solve <clears throat> challenges for themselves, trying things out, telling their friends, talking to their administrator and saying, we need more of this. So right now, lots of decision making is happening kind of at the bottom. And I think we're saying we think it needs to happen at all levels. Uh, and then of course, just kind of a little bit of a underscore of what I said earlier, that the implementation is really making or breaking products. Like you, if you don't have support for training, you're gonna have um, folks not able to use the technology. Um, it's not gonna have the impact that you want. And um, there's a burnout that does happen. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, then for technologists and even for you all, we saw it in the questions that you asked us, People want to know about like what are the right solutions, and the reality is it's not very hard. It's not very easy to find that, and so lots of folks are googling things to figure out like what they can use to support oral language development, or you know what's the best dashboard for data. So we we're seeing those as kind of the decision making, um, and some in some ways the lack thereof. Is, is a reality in the space. So I also now just wanna talk about the other piece of this, which is the financing. Those inside interviews also were a big part of understanding this, but just to say, you know, you all know, the reality is there's just not enough funding in early childhood. So um, we're not Pollyanna. We don't think like everything else is going well and you just need more money for technology. Um, we recognize it's an under-resourced space um, we also think that's part of the reason why you really want to leverage technology, but sometimes that feels hard. Um, but I, I, you know, we, we saw some of these realities, um, and if, Diane, if you can just go to the next slide, that'd be great, um, about funding. Um, and this was like from the inside interviews and those maps that were created. Um, one is that, you know, funding is, is often just kind of happens, you know, it's bootstrapped. It happens the way it can happen. Maybe there's a one-time grant. Maybe there's money at the end of the year. And people are, are kind of investing in technology that way. In some ways, not a surprise then that the rest, the implementation and maintenance isn't funded. People are just happy to get the thing. Um, and, you know, looking at those funding streams, and these folks did the hard work, oftentimes just not dedicated funding, almost none for technology. So that's a big thing. There's not dedicated funding. Uh, on the other hand, you know, really not a lot of strictures are not funding technology. So the reality is a lot of those program dollars come straight down and then you can pretty much do what you want with them. I would say there are some funding streams, especially around special ed and other, uh, that there might be some federal strictures, but generally tech um, is an allowable expense. So 
Um, with that, I want to basically, you know, move us into the discussion. As you can see, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of gaps, and there's challenges. But I also, you know, I'm feeling like um, from doing this work, there's a lot of, I, I think we're in a good place to start to move ourselves down the field. So with that, I want to start in on the discussion. And um, this first uh, is for all three of you. And um, so I'd love you to talk about, you know, what did you come into this project thinking when the lab calls you up and says, do you want to be a partner on this thing? You can be honest. Um, and, and what do you, you know, sort of, what do you envision as the role for technology and is there anything that's really exciting? So let's start with um, audience. Feel free to chat in as well during this time, but Rebecca, why don't we start with you? Absolutely, thank you. The, what I was thinking about is when we start looking at the funding streams, wondering what progress had been made and would there actually be some funding streams for technology? And unfortunately, you know, across Illinois and across most of the country with early childhood, we don't. Um, but we at least are seeing it listed, to your point, as allowable expense, which is important. Um, and I think the thing that surprised me in conversations um, uh, that I continue to worry about, um, but at least we're acknowledging it now, is that comment you made about that implementation can make or break a product. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes what we see is that even if there is funding or funding is used, it's used to buy the thing or buy the software. But, but what we really need to think about is the what is the cost of that implementation, what is the cost of the people on the ground, and what is the cost of the training and the retraining. And so I think that like, what I'm excited about is that people are actually realizing those total costs right. and beginning to think about those and beginning to advocate for those. Fantastic. Thanks, Rebecca. What about, what about you, Stephanie? So, um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, David Fagan, who's our early childhood policy associate who did a lot of this research too. And I think for both of us, when we started this project and Catherine came to us, our reaction was, we know nothing about this mm -hmm. and we're super curious. So, you know, the question of um, what funding sources fund technology, we thought we have no idea, let's look into this. And, you know, you can see from the Texas funding map that our early childhood funding is, you know, this crazy six different agencies and federal funds flowing all over. So, so that part was fascinating. I would say, you know, we are in a place where, um, and I've been in early childhood a long time, we're constantly thinking about our kids safe, are they learning? You know, are teachers supported? Uh, and so we're thinking about safety and quality and, and all these things. And really, you know, as an early childhood advocate, not been thinking about sort of the efficiency mm -hmm. of what teachers and administrators mm -hmm. have and what, you know, what makes these businesses and programs run better. Right. And so it was very eye opening to hear a lot of their questions. Um, hear a lot about how there uh, lots of early childhood folks are just winging it because they don't know what the best practice is and they're they're googling you know certain tools but they don't have a really good source as Rebecca mentioned earlier so I think um, it's it's we learned a lot and I'm actually really excited to keep learning what opportunities and what needs there are out there fantastic Stephanie Patricia um, for, for us, it was um, so exciting to see that um, we were exploring the use of technology in early childhood. I do think, I mean, I'm a big fan of um, just thinking about how to use technology to improve our systems uh, and uh, help teachers and parents. So I think California is at a, at a moment where bringing this topic is key and in, in, in considering more like how can we use technology to um, make, uh, uh, you know, our work and the work of our teachers and, fam and families who are trying to get care easier. And I think this is the time for us to bring this idea. So I think it, it, we were super excited and are looking forward to keep the conversation going. Fantastic. Thanks, Patricia. Okay, so let's take another cut at this too, which is we've talked about this range of challenges that people have in the space, the extent to which solutions are working or not, or haven't even been developed. Could you talk about what you see as the biggest opportunity when you think about that triangle? Like, where do you think we should really be kind of 
doubling down? Um, and where should tech entrepreneurs and funders be thinking about um, sort of starting? So uh, Rebecca, could you share your, your thoughts on that? Yes, I think about it. I really think about that, that operational side and that efficiency side, right? We have a huge workforce crisis. Technology is not going to fix the workforce crisis, but it might make it a little bit easier so that, so that teachers and leaders can spend more time with on actually teacher-child interactions in the classroom um, and less time on those operational things. We're not ever going to get rid of them. Paperwork will always be a piece of it, but could technology make it more efficient? Um, make it faster so that we can at least cut down the time of that. Fantastic. Patricia, want to take a shot at that? Yeah, sure. So I think that there are a, a lot of different opportunities um, to invest in data. I think that one is at the state level in terms of data. It's like, how can we uh, create a system where we collect data and we use it. Um, also for teachers in terms of professional development, how do we make it easier for them to use assessments to get professional development using technology and also for providers to do uh, administration of their you know, work and uh, workforce and for um, the parents. So at every level, I see opportunities. And um, it's just integrating and finding the best way to, um, you know, uh, see what works and what could we do um, for, you know, to make it happen. Fantastic. And and um, Stephanie, I was I had left you out on the run of show for this, but oh, that's we, have, we have like thirty seconds. So tell me what you think needs to happen in Texas. Well, I actually think there's a lot of excitement. Um, in a bunch of different communities here around like referral sources, referral hubs, mm -hmm. you know, how do families find services and where there's openings. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, texting, I saw, you know, somebody's on from Bright by Text and different communities are using different technologies. And so, you know, I think there's an opportunity to learn from each other, but also we do have this system where parents like throw up their hands and like, where do I go? Um, or pediatricians might say, I, I know a mom or a child wants a service, but I really don't know how to get them there. And right. I feel like in addition to things that are classroom facing, right. sort of about back office, there are things that communities could do to just make our system more efficient. And mm -hmm. there's a role for technology in that too. Right. I really love that. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're working on a master plan for early learning and care in California and like at the center of it is that whatever we do needs to be family centered. And right. we need to be thinking about like, what's the experience of families as they try to get the supports that are available to them. So to your, your point about kind of resource navigation, I think benefits integration. These are some of these are big system solutions, but super important. Um, thank you for that. So and I, I'm just gonna say I'm I'm a mother of an eight year old. Can we just add like summer camp registration? Into <laughs> it's it's oh, horrific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if we see you quit your job and like launch a you know some kind of startup, we'll know. It's okay. Awesome. We want to keep you in early childhood, but eight's kind of part of the continuum. Um, okay. So next uh, thing to talk about is just a little bit more texture for maybe your state, like. What is something you learned about your state? I mean, Stephanie, you talked about, I didn't, you didn't really know how the funding worked, but are there any particular insights or stories that resonated with you or the team members that they did this that you think are worth sharing with the group? And let me start with you, Stephanie. Yeah, we heard um, uh, over and over that, it was something you mentioned, Catherine, that you know there are just people in an early childhood center, whatever kind, who just take it on themselves to pick out a tool because they feel like they it's needed and there isn't really a process or a hierarchy mm -hmm. and it's like whoever has initiative go for it you google it if you you ask a colleague and maybe that's what you pick right. but you don't really have a sense of like what's a best practice where do you get good guidance um how to not spend all that time researching something new if somebody else likely has so we don't want duplication of effort among very very busy stretched people we right. also heard that people in early childhood often feel like the materials they get, the technology they get is kind of a hand-me-down. You know, we heard that from people in pre-K and school districts, like whatever they get is the stuff the third, you know, third grade, fourth grade, middle school people didn't really want anymore. Right. And it's not necessarily developmentally appropriate 
even for what teachers need in that space. Um, and then we also heard things like, um, uh, you know, there, we have a generational divide. Lots of people in early childhood, you know, have been in this world a long time and are not particularly tech savvy um, or interested in learning about the new technology and the, you know, the younger generation is much more comfortable. And so in the same setting, in the same center, how do we overcome that generational divide? Right. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. I just wanted to mention that uh, we've uh, shout out to Dana Emanuel, who's also on the chat and talked about part of this being also like, yeah, how do you navigate all of these solutions? How are you supposed to know? And I think that's one of the things we spend some more time talking about, like what's the next step on that? Um, but let me actually turn to Rebecca on this same, on the same prompt. So I would say ditto to everything Stephanie said. I think that's a Illinois, a Texas, probably a California and national, those issues that you brought up. The one different piece I would talk about is this, this concept of total cost of ownership mm -hmm. that um, as people who are new to buying technology are buying technology, um, the need to understand what that total long-term cost is, as well as I call it the all-in cost. So what's the top for the software? What's the cost for the training? And then what are those longer-term carry costs? Because oftentimes you see states like Illinois buying technology as part of a PDG grant or a race to the top grant or a, a, you know, another kind of uh, federal one-time uh, purchase, but then we need to make sure that that technology can continue after that money ends. Mm -hmm. And really thinking about how do we provide training or an understanding for people to really think in that way, um, as well as to the technologists out there for you to help show that, to say, okay, this is how we buy it, and then this is the total cost of how you should budget it or localities could budget for this over time. Thanks, great, appreciate that. Um, Patricia, we're going we're gonna to catch you on the next round first, okay? Keep ourselves on time. But uh, I wanted to kind of to round out this first tranche of discussion around the insights. Um, each of you spent way too much time, probably from your perspective, on trying to like figure out all this, this budget mapping. And that's just part of the struggle of our space, which is there's so many funding streams. And, you know, what we're struggling with or what a tech entrepreneur would struggle with in finding out like where could you possibly find public funding is something that we're struggling with on a range of levels that are super important about like, how do we make these programs work? And many of us are braiding and blending and bootstrapping funding to make this happen. But if you could um, tell us about any ahas, and this can be about, you know, kind of the technology or not, I'm, I actually have seen some chats in here about funding streams and I know people have come to us and said, hey, you missed some stuff. Um, let me say we were doing a lot of this thinking about the entrepreneurs and rec didn't really recognize how much of a just a, a leave behind this would be in general uh, from this project. So but, but if, if you could start with maybe Patricia talking a little bit about the, the budget profiles and the financing side. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, it was, again, great to see that there um, are so many opportunities to leverage technology uh, in so many different levels. And, you know, especially for us, because we um, prioritize the workforce piece, just thinking about how to connect uh, ways to um, develop uh, professional development for teachers using technology, making it easier. Um, and also, you know, how do you connect the private and public, um, you know, partnerships where you see innovation and you connect it to, you know, what's happening at the state level. So it's not just a one-time investment that works, that it's great, but nobody really um, can learn about it or scale it. So I think that what we saw, like, is just there is an opportunity for it just really make all those connections. And especially in areas like, for example, dual language learning, that we know there is a great need. Um, how do we use technology to uh, help teachers, um, you know, get the tools they need? So I think it was just great to see that there is uh, a lot of options out there, and that it, it, it's the right time to to have this conversation. Thanks, thanks, Patricia, uh, Rebecca. Two things that stood out to me is a couple is one of 
with t Title I preschool or with, or with preschool just in the public school systems, ways for those school districts who already are maybe having a contract for something to just add on early childhood. You often see this with publishers of curriculum adding on early childhood. Their, their, their goal is to sell to K-12. Now, some of those K-12 technologies are not appropriate, but when it is a software system, figuring out the way to add those in. The other thing um, we see is for kind of a state funding stream like Preschool for All and a national or federal to local funding stream like Head Start, if they can't share the cost, if you have one saying, we'll buy this, and the other saying, we'll do the training for it, and then sharing those, which is just another way of braiding and blending, but really making sure they're, you know, they're thinking about how to share those technology costs across the board. Ben, thanks, Rebecca. And uh, let's round this out with Stephanie. You have anything to add? I, um, you know, I was thinking about our early intervention providers because we did interview some of them and, you know, they're in a situation here in California, I mean, in Texas where, um, you know, they have to fundraise locally to make up for a gap in their state budget funding. And so it's one of those things where when you are so strapped that you have to fundraise locally to close, you know, to, to, be sustainable it's like are you really going to spend it on technology you're going to spend it on some limited benefits so you're going to spend it on uh you know other things that are really forward facing for parents and i i i just got the sense through our interviews that um you know technology was often pretty low on the totem pole for priorities and i i i think it's probably in a sense related to the fact that they're not really clear how it sort of helps the business model yeah. What should be priorities? You know, which are things that parents will be excited that they're using, or things that parents might be a little bit worried that they're using? And right. so, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the kind of parent understanding um, and whether there's queasiness in, in all of this. You know, we are talking about what educators are using for themselves, but still, I think you know, there's a some divide there about what's appropriate um, when working with kids. And so I, I, I think it kind of bubbles over into the financing aspect of it. And, you know, we've had big increases in funding for full day pre-K in this state, which is incredible, and lots of discussion around early literacy, but, uh, and training of teachers, like going to two trainings to learn about early literacy, but not very much discussion at all about technology. So right. I think it's a prime yeah. time for it. Uh, well, that kind of leads us to our next conversation. So thank you first for sharing some of your own insights and reflections on what we learned. And I'd like to now, before we open it up for Q and A, turn to kind of the recommendations section which was like recognizing that we all have a role to play in this. And um, if you're thinking about what it's gonna take for good things to happen, the program implementers are critical and like what role do they need to play? What supports they need to have? What voice? Um, we then have the policymakers and system leaders. Like there's, there, there's some lots of stuff that, you know, we articulate that in the report and people can take a look at that. But funders as well, like both the private and foundation funders, what role should they be playing in supporting smart EC tech? Um, and then the technologists themselves. So with that, I'd like to move us into that conversation. I also want to say that um, I see questions in the chat that are going to ask open-ended for us, but also others in this conversation, feel free to respond yourself because I think there's just more that we can, than we can answer on this webinar. But let's just start with um, these go forward strategies. And for each of you, like, you know, pick your poison. Like, where do you think we need to go? What's most important? Um, or you can talk about a range of those things. But maybe, um, Rebecca, just, you know, you've spent a lot of time at the ounce. You've been in this space. You're balancing all of these different things and seeing these players. Like, what do we need to do? I was actually looking through the chat and, and Dana Emanuel talked about fragmentation and that is one of the ounces uh, words right now and one of my words is that we have a fragmented system right now as we think across child care, uh, home visiting, family, uh, friend and neighbor care, and we need technology and technologists to help us 
stop that fragmentation, not to continue it, right? And so as we think about technology, we don't need 10 different coaching apps or we don't need 10 different family engagement programs. How do we begin to say, this is one of the things the Alps thinks about, what is one technology good at and what's another technology good at and how do we try to work across my ask to the technology and to entrepreneurs to really think about how can you work across um, so that we have some more unification of what we're developing and putting out there. Um, and that is my goal. If nothing else, if we can at least, as we're thinking about making sure these, these apps are compatible, make sure if it's something that's web-based, making sure that there's single sign-on or that data can be shared. Uh, because one of the main things I hear from people on the ground is that, you know, I have four different apps that I have to put information into, or I have to put data into four different websites. And so really thinking about that fragmentation issue and how can we address it together. I'm, I'm going to come back to you, I mean, or, or maybe Rebecca, like when we talk about what you're thinking of doing next out of this, I'd love to come back to you and ask you like, what is, what, what does that look like? Like, what would the steps be for that? Um, but let, let's have Stephanie um, weigh in on this as well. Like, do we need to I, um, I keep thinking about the role of philanthropy in this and that, um, you know, it's a great opportunity for them to uh, get engaged in some, you know, local needs and, you know, find, ask the question, like, what do, you know, what do some of the early childhood programs and services really need? And, and then provide that and see how it goes and test it and evaluate it. Um, I think the other big question, and it goes to Rebecca's point about, you know, how many different things do we want people to use is having, making sure there's a really good discussion about what's the purpose and like who's the odd who's the user and who's the audience uh, i mean we've all been in situations where someone you know shoves a new technology down our throat and you're like I, you know i have to input this stuff and it's a waste of my time i don't understand the benefit of it to me um and we're never going to get a good result if that's the case so it's it really has to be which which i think is what's so cool about this report is we've asked the potential users or people who are using technology you know what is important to them and what how would they want it how would they want to use it and i think that has to be at the core of everything is you want to communicate with parents mm -hmm. you know these are your options you want to do more kind of efficiency with accounting and staffing and monitoring the training of your folks like that's going to be something else and and this is where they're going to need a lot of guidance on what are the what's the best technologies for those specific purposes and not just assume, you know, that there's going to be a one size fits all for every use. Right, right. Really good insight. Um, Patricia, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's all about um, coordination and leadership. So between the state, the philanthropy providers and families. So uh, I think that if for California, now that we're going through a master plan, so knowing that the administration, the new administration, you know, it appreciates technology and also it's willing to coordinate with philanthropy in terms of investing in those pilots, but at the same time, getting input from providers, teachers who are using the technology day to day. And, and it's basically what, what do you need and what works and what's out there that we should consider. And also, you know, with parents, it's like, we know they, they use technology, they have smartphones and they communicate via that. So how can we engage them and be, make them part of the system? So I think that's key for all, you know, to be um, communicating at the same time and not separate, you know, how like philanthropy here doing pilots, but then getting the state involved. So I think now working as, um, as a team to really have a vision and find the best way to use technology. Great, thanks. Um, you know, on this, and I'm, you know, we're definitely kind of hearing the same struggles and the same, and, and you know, it, what comes first. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, do do we think that is there? If you had to like say, like, it's really on these people to do this thing first. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Do you, you know, who who bears the burden or? who can do the most, or are we saying like, we all have to show up at the same time and just start working? Well, one question I had, Catherine, as I was thinking about this was, um, you know, ultimately, if technology really helps 
uh, you know, produce higher quality learning environments for our kids, should it end up being free, right? So do we want philanthropy and technologists and others to, uh, you know, invest in services and, you know, interesting kind of technological innovations that communities try and then ultimately, you know, the state can provide some of those same, you know, right. technologies, for-profit technologies, you know, to early childhood for free. Um, right. You know, especially if there's some uniformity and some that are really proven to work. Like, I think that's a question. We've seen that here with some of the assessment, you know, tools in early childhood. And, mm -hmm. you know, now we see early childhood providers doing a lot more, you know, high quality school readiness assessments because they're free. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think we, as we think about how we'd scale it up, we're going to really have to think about where's the public investment going to come from? How do we make an argument for it? And we're only going to get there if we can show that it really makes a difference in terms of cost savings, in terms of efficiency. Parents are really happy that their centers are using it, um, that there are parent facing ones that really help them engage with their uh, teachers and providers and and their kids and um, so I think we're all kind of a long way off from that probably but this is an opportunity to show what works and it's exciting. On, on that um, kind of you made a call out um, to philanthropists and I would say kind of philanthropists as well as VC is you mentioned the evaluation piece um, Stephanie and I think that's so important I'm like putting on my research and evaluation hat one of the hardest things we actually we often find to get funded is the evaluation of some of this work um, and so it, but we know that's the first thing that everyone asks about so I think as we're doing this uh, really thinking about what is the what is the cost to, to effectively evaluate and how can we use some kind of rapid cycle evaluation as well as some potential it's not evaluation but cost modeling right it, are there savings that can be gained in time and infrastructure um, that could then be leveraged later and really doing a good job on that as part of those initial implementations in communities those are two really like provocative topics which is I want to spend some more time with them Patricia, do you want to just chime in here and then we can uh, keep this conversation going for the next few minutes around a few of these topics? Yeah, yeah, I think I agree um, with what you, you know, you both said. And um, I just think finding, as, as I see the comments, is a, there's so much out there, right? But how can we really centralize uh, and, and um, you know, get a place where we can have resources of, about best practices and where to use it. So I think that's one of the key things work that the philanthropy can help to. And then um, in coordination with the state and the standards and what, what the goals uh, that we want to accomplish, I think that that should be something that should be prioritized too. And Catherine, we didn't, haven't talked about the equity piece of it, but you know, the people in the chat box have brought up you know, broadband issues and you brought up wireless, but there's also the yeah. question of, you know, which, you know, parents and community providers are more likely to have access to yeah. these sorts of technologies. Yeah. And maybe that's an area where philanthropy can, you know, and our public advocacy can fill that gap because we really don't want, the way, there's already a digital divide. So we don't want to exacerbate it in the early childhood space if we can avoid it. That's a really good point. And I think, you're, Stephanie, kind of pushing us to think about, uh, I'm, I'm going to connect some dots and say, you're, I think you're calling on state at the state level, at the systems level, there is some really important kind of investments and um, funding and potentially, I thought your point about, like, on the equity side of this, are there some of these product, products that should just be free and that the, a state should say, there are certain solutions that we feel really good about and we're going to make those available to everyone. I think that's a really, um, you know, a provocative thought. And I also feel like we do have to have a better um, process to winnow, a, you know, winnow through solutions because right now, I think I also heard lots of, of uh, early childhood people feel like there's just a big rush, you know, like lots of people coming to them and saying, try this, try that. And there's, there's not really a way for them to kind of have gated experimentation with some of these technology solutions. So you can end up like working on something that isn't really going the, in the right direction, but like 
it's not really being uncovered that way. So it does to, if I, if I had my kind of magic wand for government and systems leaders, I do think there does need to be reform of the procurement processes for technology. And I know in California, we're excited to see that already happening, to be thinking about how do you put out a challenge and ask for solutions in response to that versus just waiting to see what comes, saying like, here's what we in our public systems are dealing with. And if you want to work on that, then we're really excited and we're going to support that and potentially make that something that we want to provide for everyone. So I, I want to just chime in before we move on that I think that's really important. And I do think some of these just, are there some solutions that just need to be, uh, need to be created? So um, I, before we move to a Q and A, I would like maybe you to, each of you to talk about like, well, then what are you going to do next? Um, based on learned um, and and if there are particular things happening in your state or things that you can talk about it'd be great for the for the audience to hear about that uh that's um why don't rebecca why don't you take a crack at yeah that? i can start i think because one of the things we haven't mentioned really yet is this idea of user-centered design um, and I think that is one of the takeaways that I think we are hearing more about um, in, in Illinois and this idea of both on the procurement side, but even before that in conversations with technologists yeah. um, and philanthropists who are funding things of, you know, I, I as a system leader or an organizational leader can make a decision, but the people on the ground, the teachers, the, the child care administrators, and the parents who will be using that have a much better understanding for what they need. Yeah. And making sure those people are at the table from the beginning, mm -hmm. particularly, you know, even at the beginning when technology is developing, but definitely somehow thinking about this, this what do we need and what features do we need? Um, and not having it be just a, you know, a, a stand it, but having it truly be someone who is helping to drive that process. Because I think the the times that those people have come to the table in, in kind of local Chicago meetings, um, like the benefit is immense and decisions really would, might are changed because of that. Um, and I think you get more of an equity lens, right? Because those are the problems that they are facing, not the problems that we perceive that people are facing. Such a great point. And I'm like remiss that it is not come up, you know, in that well articulated way in this conversation. So I really think that you're, you've got it right. It's like, what are the solutions we need and like who knows best about what those need to be. So um, that, and I assume what you're saying is that in Illinois, you're gonna be like pushing for that. It sounds like you already are as an institution. Um, so that's your kind of, uh, one of your commitments is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. Um, okay, Stephanie, what are you thinking? Uh, you know, the where we're hearing about it the most and so i think where we'll probably end up spending more time now is on the i refer to it as referral hub but it's like a parent portal that you know various communities are thinking about and so i think we'll try to learn a little bit more about the choices they made um and what are the pros and cons to the various um you know technologies that were chosen so we can uh, raise that up to policymakers and philanthropists to help to help fund those. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of discussion and movement in Texas around teleservices, telehealth, uh -huh. so even in even in our early intervention program, uh, because we you know the the drives and uh, right. the communication is so tough. And so I'm and so there's both the communication with families and the sharing of information. Um, and how all that data kind of gets reported. So that's another area where we're going to monitor. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, we're going to, as, as there are opportunities for expanded funding for early childhood, I think we're going to now have in the back of our mind, like, can some of that be flexible enough to be used for technology and mm -hmm. how can we make sure that happens? So, uh, and that was just from the learning of this um, project. So it's, it's been wonderful for us. Thanks, Stephanie. Patricia, want to round out your commitments and insights? Yeah, well, time? yeah, we will continue to elevate, you know, the use of technology right now in California, given where we are. Um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, things going on in terms of thinking of having more efficient systems for parents, for families, for kids. So I uh, think having technology is one of the, of the ways that could make that happen and thinking how can we make 
life easier for parents, providers, and how can we really um, improve the quality of all the programs through technology. I think that continue to elevate that and having uh, technology as you know a central piece and not a side uh, thing that you think after. I think you know we'll continue to do that, especially for you know for our early edge help how to help teachers um, get the training they need and parents access to the the programs they need to. Thanks, Patricia, and I know that I mean just from knowing you, you've been a kind of technology. So, you know, a person who's like, there's stuff here that we need to leverage um, for a long time. So it's great to have you um, on our team. Um, with this, I now, you know, would love to just move into the Q&A portion. And I actually think that one thing I do want to say is, and it, it, it kind of sets up what this last round of conversation will be about, is lots of people I think are on this webinar who are like, I love all that you're saying, Yes, we need to do all that. I may or may not have a direct role in that, um, but I definitely want and feel like I, I want to figure out how I can go to one place and we don't recreate the wheel a million times in 50 states. And um, I feel like we haven't, you know, I want us to think about that. Um, I do as kind of an, um, a resource uh, shout out, I want to uh, to recognize Promise Venture Studios. And I want, I think Diana, you were gonna put in the chat their, uh, the link to their venture index. So lots of people are like, what's good for parent engagement? How can I look at X, Y, or Z? And I think that that index, um, I, you know, I really appreciate what Promise Venture Studio has done. They're really building an ecosystem around um, early childhood technologists and doing a fantastic job of connecting with the early childhood field to create more and better solutions. So um, check out that venture index. It's gonna tell you, um, I don't know how many are in there, but it's a lot. It's not the easy, you know, for you, if you want like everything that's gonna help me with enrollment um, or resource navigation, it, I don't think it's set up to do that, but there's a lot of really great information there. So with that, um, I'd like to just, ask us to have a conversation together about how do we address what folks on this um, webinar are saying, which is like, I need, I need to make this, I want good information, I want curated information. We've talked about we need more standards, we need to, um, you know, to know what we're using is good. Like, what are we gonna do about that? Um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about Celia, Celia Gomez Schroeder is saying that, um, we have got um, Matthew Tinsley and some others all talking about that. So what are, yeah, what are we gonna do? I mean, I can kick us off there. I mean, one of the things I try to do is think about like short term, long term, middle term, right? Short, middle, long. And some of it is like, what are the short term things we can do? And one of those is every, one of the things we're trying to do with the ounce is every conversation we have with someone, we are trying to connect them. Like, oh, you're talking about doing that? Do you know that these three people are also doing that? And here is their contact information and this is how they're doing different, differently. And or at the ounce, we were interested in doing this, but we think there's a, a piece that someone else would be better at. Who could we look at to do that? So I think, it, and that's a very, that's a short term thing that that's something we can always do. Just be better relationship, better connectors to make sure people who are in different parts of the company or, or co country or in different uh, areas in the field learn about others. Because I think that's one of the pieces. Like, it, or particularly if something's happening in health or, or K-12, how do we learn from that? And then I think the longer term are the, how do you begin to, to you know, use something like the Promise Ventures Index or standards around early childhood technology to yeah. make that be, so that's not just relationship based, but it's actually maybe based in technology, a way to, to find that information. Either of the two, of, the other two of you want to say anything about this? Um, I'm not, I'm not like asking for people to raise their hands and say they're going to be the new platform and curator of products, but eventually we're going to have to find out like where that should be. Should it be like, is this something government should do? Should, um, should the, should the tech sector do this? Should the early childhood sector get funded to do it? Like where, where should this happen? a very interesting question. No one's going to look to me to be chief technology officer, that's for sure. But maybe, you know, in um, 
early learning departments, you know, at the state level, whether it's an education agency or, you know, childcare, maybe that's, that'd be an interesting position. I just keep thinking uh, that, you know, my experience, the way that the early childhood world learns from each other is through kind of best practice learning communities. And, um, and then they, that sort of filters, you know, information, you know, so they can decide what works for them. I, I can see how challenging it would be to, to be the consumer when you have all these vendors coming to you and it's very hard to, you know, assess what's the right thing for you. So I think the more that there's a learning community and that this topic is one of the discussions yeah. that will come up either at conferences or, you know, association meetings or other things. I mean, we should try to encourage this conversation in the existing coalitions and learning communities um, that are in our state and communities. Thanks. Thanks for that, Stephanie. I think those are really good thoughts. And I'm going to, um, you know, I, I think that there's sort of a, a short list of things that I feel like people are saying they really need to have happen. And I think one of the things we need to do is in the, you know, get the right groups of people together to figure out, like, how do we deliver on this? Because I think we see early childhood educators saying we're open to this, but we need help and um, we need some folks to, like, figure out how to get some of this done. And I do think that success also breeds more success. And I think we have to show people that technology can help make their lives better and make their work stronger. So before I let um, I go to the feedback survey, Patricia, just kind of last thoughts um, about this and maybe just ending with, you know, a couple, yeah, any, any sort of parting thoughts and then we'll get to the survey. Um, yes, I, I, as, as I was uh, hearing Stephanie, I was like, yeah, you know, now that we in California, we're, we're thinking about restructuring um, at the state level with um, your early childhood department, I think having a technology mm -hmm. person, just that, you know, will send a signal of like, okay, it matters. And as, as a way of like, um, sending the message that we should use it across and with all programs to for the benefit of everyone that is in the field. So think thinking about that, it's like how can we just really elevate it at, to that level? So yeah. and and centralize it, right? It's just so we can we can really think about uh, the benefits for the whole system. I would say yeah. that you know I think that that's something that we should continue to to advocate for and really see see it as a way to um, elevate technology, the use of technology for the benefit of kids and families. Thank you. I really think you, that's a great kind of investing in techno technology leadership does seem like a really smart next step. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we have a feedback poll and I think Diana is going to um, get that set up so people can respond. But just thank you so much. I want to thank the partners here, I think this is just the foothills of a longer journey to get this right and to really add value to early childhood space. But I, I hope that um, we've kind of engendered a conversation that continues um, as we all you know, create more and better impact and support for the space. So thank you for joining us today and please fill out the survey. I'm looking forward to what comes next. We're gonna be doing some more follow on with the uh, tech entrepreneurs, but also thinking about uh, how do we create um, some go forward steps. So thanks again. Take care.